So corporate surveillance is basically happening all the time and in ways we don't even think about on a day-to-day -day basis. When people talk about corporate surveillance, what they mean is when a company collects information about an individual, uh, often when that individual is not necessarily aware that that collection is occurring. I mean, every time you, you browse the internet, every time you use an app on your phone, even driving your car or just being out in public, oftentimes corporate surveillance is occurring. Social media companies like Google and Facebook and Twitter collect a lot of information, but they're not doing it to sell to third parties. They're mainly collecting this information to give content to other users, but just as importantly, they're using it to create profiles of individuals to advertise towards. Now, while this is generally the model that is supported on the internet, I think there's a lot of concern whether or not all this data collection really is useful to better advertise. Big tech companies, they don't sell your data to other companies. They have very little incentive to do so. Data about you and your interests is their secret sauce when they're selling advertising to companies. Imagine if you had to pay every time you uploaded a photo to Facebook um, because you're using their computer. The business model that we have now is not only good for the companies and good for Facebook, it's good for the user because it makes for a much more seamless experience. I started working on these kinds of projects at Clarify. And this company focused on computer vision, which is a really exciting field of artificial intelligence. So you can imagine this can be used for a lot of really great things. It can be used to help diagnose diseases and cancer, even better than a doctor can in some cases. Um, it can be used to examine the impact of climate change using satellite footage. But as I found out over time, there are also a lot of things that it can do that maybe we don't want as a society. I wrote a letter to our CEO asking him to make certain promises to us. I wanted to make sure that he would never collect data without anybody's permission or consent. I wanted to make sure that he put constraints on, on facial recognition. It was surprising then when the CEO called a meeting uh, for the whole company, it was an optional meeting, and he said you know, that we would be there to discuss the issues in the letter and he uh, pulled the meeting together. Of course, the whole company showed up, and you know, he ended that meeting by telling us that he had no intention of putting constraints on, on these kinds of things, and that's when I knew I had to quit. The real big question and concern right now is the trade-off between data collection and the servicing of ads, and I think that consumers mostly really do love a lot of these services, we often take for granted the, the tools that corporate surveillance has brought to us. Uh, mapping software is a great example. Uh, I remember taking cross-country trips when I was a kid where my dad had this giant atlas. It was never accurate, it couldn't be updated, it certainly didn't tell us what the traffic was going to be. Uh, and so whether it's a cross-country trip or a trip to a new grocery store you haven't been to before, uh, this mapping software is just incredibly powerful and it's driven by information. And some of that information is information about us because that's how it works. Society is kind of built in a way that to interact in modern society, you don't really have a choice about your, your data. And often you can't correct that, collect, that collection of information. Uh, you can't ask for it to be deleted. Um, you, you can't necessarily port that data to somewhere else in some, some instances. And that all this information that's collected um, is retained basically forever and we don't know how it's going to be used in the future and it can manipulate us in terms of how we vote potentially it can manipulate us in terms of you know what we purchase um, and it can also be used to restrict our options to me this data collection really equates to power and there need to be checks on what companies can do with all of our livelihoods, our information, the photos of us that get sent around the world um, for tagging. In particular, I, I start worrying a lot about um, things like smart homes and smart doorbell cameras that either connect directly to law enforcement or can be subpoenaed in court. Meanwhile, the, the big tech CEOs you know, go in front of Congress and they're asked, you know, are these devices recording us all the time? And somehow are able to convince the public that they're not. But as somebody who helps, who has helped to build these kinds of technologies, I can tell you they absolutely are. Look, there's just no credible evidence that your cell phone is comprehensively recording every word that you say. That is the sort of feature that not only would be easy for tech experts to actually 
uh, uncover, it would violate literally dozens of federal and state wiretapping laws. Most of the big cases that we actually care about, including Experion and, and Target, these are really data, data security issues, much more than data privacy issues. People often confuse data security and data privacy. There are different concepts. Data security is about protecting information of all kinds from people who want to misuse it. And I mean specifically bad actors like hackers. I think everybody agrees that we need to keep data secure, but that's really different than data privacy. In privacy, we're debating how companies that are businesses that are trying to serve me are allowed to use information about me. And there, there's much less agreement. One thing that markets are very good at is delivering solutions that match people's preferences, even when people have very different preferences from each other. One thing that governments are particularly bad at is doing that um, because they have to set one rule uh, that governs the, the, all the practices. And so when government steps into this space, it should be sure that the type of problem that it's trying to solve is a problem that the overwhelming majority of people care about. What we really should be ensuring that is protected are those very specific worrying and, and costly acts. Arguably, the FTC doesn't have the authority right now. Uh, they don't have the political will right now. And they've also, through their history, have shown that they will not uh, extend the necessary privacy protections to address the large-scale corporate surveillance that, happen that currently happens. Because of the lack of will shown by the FTC to address these issues, it makes more sense to create a new independent agency that will acquire specific expertise in the area of data protection and privacy. When you build agencies that are built for one specific industry, they tend to get captured by that industry pretty quickly. The FTC has been somewhat immune to that because they are a general agency. They regulate across the economy. Now stepping up its investigation into big tech companies today, ordering five internet giants to- There is general agreement that the FTC is understaffed, and my hope is really that we do the easiest things first. Instead of overhauling the entire regulatory system, give the FTC the staff it needs, work with the DOJ to ensure privacy protection. There's a lot that can be done in the interim where you don't need a federal privacy law. There are a lot of alternatives for privacy protection, and the United States currently is involved and has among the most robust. The FTC is very active in going after the worst actors. There is at least an important distinction to be made between the European system and the current United States system, because it's not necessarily clear what really the regulatory system gets you as far as benefits. But when it comes to, for example, the GDPR and when it comes to Europe, people aren't that much more happy with their services. They are able to delete some things, but th there's still a lot of concerns about how data is used. Sometimes there are some trade-offs from implementing better data protection. Uh, we may end up seeing some of these in, in California. The state's Consumer Protection Act went into effect on January 1st. The internet and tech companies, they've evolved from this default status that you may create the data, but it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the company that stores it and holds it, and it's their right to sell it and use it as they want. That's been the default for how many tech companies and the internet has evolved. It's only recently that consumers have started to say, wait a second, I don't know if I really agree to this exchange. I'm not sure that there is much of a difference between data collection and surveillance. And the reason is that when you have the infrastructure to monitor anybody, even if that isn't in an active mode, it makes it so easy for law enforcement and private citizens or politicians to come and interfere with my life. Um, that, that is a really dangerous proposition, especially when you think about things like corruption within companies. Since I've left my job, I have been so lucky to get involved with so many great causes. You, you realize this is not just a problem that I've encountered or the people at Clarify have encountered. This is something that's happening on a societal level. 
Often we talk about data privacy as an abstract concept, but I've found it uh, very helpful to ask, what harm to consumers are we worried about? What specific harm? More needs to be done uh, because of the size of the problem here. In terms of our sovereignty and our own autonomy uh, and making decisions for ourselves and not being manipulated by companies that have such fine-grained information on us that they can figure out how to change our behavior. Mere convenience is not a good enough reason for us all to have our behavior. Know a bit more about the most important thing that's happening currently, and that has happened over the last 20 years, are journalists and advocates and people working at nonprofits keeping a watchful eye on these companies and calling out things that they think need to be discussed and need to be changed. That sort of market for reputation, as I've called it sometimes, that is hugely important because these things can be very, very impactful. But I can say, you know, as somebody who has had a lot of experience in the tech industry, um, our government needs our help.